Hello, I'm Mac Brown, Rector of St. James Episcopal Church here in Taos, New Mexico, and we are so honored and pleased that you are joining us this week in worship, the second week of Advent. We begin every sermon in prayer, so my friends, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, who loves us so much to be born into the midst of us, we give you thanks for this day, for the gift and blessing of life, and for your call to us to be your people. Give us your grace so that we may hear that call and that we may be reminded that we are welcome to stand before you, faithful people loving as we are loved. This we pray in your name, the one who loves first, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, happy Advent 2. We're trudging right along uh, in your home Advent calendar. This would be the week to like that second purple or blue candle, depending on which one, which color you're rolling with. We're not to pink yet, not just yet. And this week, I'm really called to talk about this, the difficulty and perplexity of Advent, this season of getting ready, right? But getting ready for Jesus to be born. Let, let's be honest, that happened, right? We've done that part. There's this other getting ready, and a lot of times maybe we don't talk about that as much as we should. And that's the getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. Uh, Advent is this interesting season where we both honor and acknowledge and get ready for what has happened and prepare to get ready for what will happen. And I think if you're like me, which I think, I think we are, all are, uh, that can cause a little anxiety, right? This whole end of the world, apocalypse, judgment day stuff. For us humans, it can cause quite a bit of anxiety, deep, deep spiritual anxiety. You know, um, one year back in my former days, I, I would go to like Bible camps in the summer for summer camp. It's not, not a bad thing, not at all, but uh, it was interesting now that I look back on what type of curriculum we, we learned the summer after my sixth grade year, so middle school, I'm what, like 12, 13? I go, go to a week-long Bible camp where we study the book of Revelation solely. That's the only thing we studied, which, again, I have to acknowledge is a bit myopic. If you don't get the rest of the picture, the end of the story is pretty hard to handle. And we also, though, did dive into some of the gospel teachings about the end of times. And we heard we read what we learned last week that no one knows the day, not even the sun, when the second coming, this completion of God's work will happen. And so I remember this teacher telling us that it's a mystery, that no one can know the day or the time that we're to be ready. No one will know. Stay awake. And so I spent the majority of my seventh grade year Every morning, brushing my teeth and putting on dad's leftover aftershave that I, you know, I wasn't actually shaving, but you know, that, that middle school years. Every morning, brushing my teeth, saying, God, today's the day you're going to end the world. And I believed it. I, I had some moniker of faith that uh, that was the case, that today was the day that God was going to end the world. And because of the mysteries of God, because I knew that, <laughs> then God couldn't do it. So, you all can thank me for the majority of 1994. God didn't end the world then. You're welcome. I hope it was a good year. But <laughs> that's ridiculous, right? That's absurd. The anxieties that are boiled up in us when we humans think about the end of the world. And so I'm sure most of us, myself included, spend Advent thinking about the baby. I mean, I preached about the baby. But we also have to talk about the next coming when the baby is born again in our midst, and when things like pain and sorrow pass away, where death and weeping have no place, but love reigns supreme, and the altar of God illumines all of us. I mean, we forget that. We, we focus on like goats and sheeps and judgment. But did you hear what Isaiah is saying today? I mean, you've heard this. I know you've heard this. Us Episcopalians, even though we may not have studied all the Bible, you have heard this bit of Isaiah because I know you've heard a hymn written in like 1671. Comfort, comfort ye my people. Speak the, your peace, thus saith our God. I know you know that song, and I know I'm with you 
and grieving that we're not belting out that great hymn. It's 67 in your prayer book, if, in your hymn book, if you want to look at hymn 67. We anxious people all the time will forget what God has already done for us in God's time. Remember that a day is not a day to God as it is to us. As we read in our candles, our ways are not God's ways. God has decided that reconciliation and love are the only path forward. And we humans are to step into that light, to step onto the pathway that has been prepared for us by the prophets and sages and saints before us, where the ways have been made straight and level, no more curves, no more hills, a plain place to walk with our God through this grand creation. Now, again, these days are hard days, and it seems like those promises can be even further away. So what are we getting ready for, for real? I'm with you on that too, friends. But I'm not going to fall back into my anxieties and think that I have anything to do with keeping the world going. I'm not going to believe some false part of the mystery that God is going to punish us but know that God has already loved us to the tomb and through the grave. And God stands complete and reconciled with us all around the altar, feasting and feeding. Like we know the end of the story. We know the complications of Advent, getting ready for something that's already happened. But do we really wrestle with getting ready for something that has already happened? God has died and come out of the ground for us already. God has proved God's love and reconciliation and salvation for us and washed us clean so that we are able to stand blameless. So where does the blame lie then? It's in our own hearts. It's in our own minds, not in God's. How we diminish God by thinking God doesn't love everyone like God loves everyone, especially when we don't think God loves us like God loves us. My friends, we are getting ready in this season of Advent to be the people of God, to walk with God, to stand before God blamelessly. And yet, that work has already been done. We just have to acknowledge the gift given to set our baggage down, to set those expectations and judgments down, to allow God to reconcile and do the work that God does to love, full stop. So, my friends, the end of that hymn, just in case you've forgotten, ends with, tell Jerusalem that her sins are covered. Remind her that her warfare is over. We, we are God's beloved people here in this place and this time, no less loved than any other time before. We as humans still wrestle with the reality that we forget that love. And we sit in our own shadow, turning our back on the light and love of God, dwelling in our own darkness. Let us repent. Let us literally turn from our ways, hear the words of the prophets, and walk with God, the one who loves us. Loves us so much to be born as a baby in a poverty-stricken town, surrounded by the oppressive other elements of Roman government, fleeing, fleeing murderous mobs, loves us so much to walk on water, to breathe new life into those who are dead, and to die God's self to show us how much we are loved. Let us prepare the way. Let us prepare the way in our hearts so that we may be able, willing, and ready to accept the gift of God's grace, God being born in our midst and allowing us to stand blamelessly, to walk fervently alongside God in this life of love. This is what we pray in the name of the one who loves first, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.